welcome to Trendlines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Elliot Waldman. Just a quick note before we get started that if you like what you hear on Trendlines, you can stay up to date with new episodes by hitting the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts if you haven't done so already. You can also find a full archive of previous episodes at worldpoliticsreview.com slash podcast. President Donald Trump is known for having kicked off his campaign in 2015 with an infamous speech laden with racist tropes, including calling Mexican immigrants rapists and criminals. He campaigned on a promise to build a massive wall along the southern border and make Mexico pay for it, though ultimately the border wall was built using American government funds. As my guest for today explains, Trump has taken a one-dimensional approach to the U.S. relationship with Mexico, focusing almost entirely on migration and on stemming the flow of immigrants entering the country across the southern border, both legally and illegally. President-elect Joe Biden, however, is likely to take a much more conventional, multidimensional approach to the relationship, which could create challenges for both Biden's incoming administration and for Mexico's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador. Duncan Wood is the director of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Duncan, welcome to Trendlines. Great to be with you, Elliot. If you had to describe the main guiding principle or principles of President Trump's approach to Mexico, what would it be? Uh, It's a really good question. I think there are two ways to answer it. The first one, which is the most common answer that you will hear, I think, is that the Trump administration adopted a largely unidimensional approach to uh, to the relationship with Mexico, which was to focus on migration. And, you know, that that meant that uh, the Mexicans came under great pressure to collaborate with the United States on stopping or stemming Central American migration um, and particularly trans migration through uh, through Mexico. And uh, there was a kind of an understanding implicit that if Mexico delivered on migration, then the United States, and in this case, the Trump administration, would leave them alone on pretty much everything else. And I think that's, that's accurate. That's accurate in terms of you know, what happened. But if I was to say that there was one uh, main element of the approach itself uh, that was taken by the Trump administration, it was the recognition of the power disparities in the relationship. And I think that, uh, you know, Trump was very good on this in, in general in foreign policy, recognizing that the United States carries a big stick. And in the case of its relationship with Mexico, um, you know, for, for, for Mexico, the relationship with the United States is an existential one. If you don't have access to the U.S. market or if you don't have unhindered access to the U.S. market, then there are enormous costs Um you know, particularly in terms of economic growth and the stability, economic stability of the country. And the recognition of this by the Trump administration meant that they were able to insist on migration and they were able to insist on other issues. I mean, you know, USMCA negotiations, for example. You're referring to the the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, the uh, replacement for the NAFTA trade deal? Yeah, that's right. The USMCA, which uh, which came in, replaced uh, NAFTA on uh, the 1st of July 2020. Um, you know, the recognition how, of how important that was or that is to Mexico, um, you know, that, that meant that the United States had this uh, interdependent relationship with Mexico, but it's a highly asymmetrical um, dependency. And, you know, the United States needs Mexico, but Mexico needs the United States a lot more. And that recognition, I think, is, is, is critical in understanding how Trump approached his relationship with Mexico. He, uh, and of course, there was, there was a fundamental shift in the middle of the administration. Once Andres Manuel López Obrador, or AMLO, uh, won the presidency in Mexico, there was a focus uh, on you know, sort of building a friendly relationship uh, with AMLO. But there was a a recognition that AMLO was going to give Trump exactly what he wanted on migration if and when Trump pushed for it. And that's exactly what happened. To what extent did that approach create resentment or animosity toward the United States, uh, not only among officials in Mexico City, but also among the Mexican populace more generally? Yes, it's such an interesting uh, situation, Elliot, because, you know, back in, uh, uh, in 20, uh, 2016, the, uh, the election, presidential election campaign of that year here in the United States, all of the terribly negative things that Trump said about, uh, about Mexico and Mexicans 
created an enormous amount of ill will towards him. And that ill will endured until the AMLO administration came in on the 1st of December 2018. From that point on, AMLO has sent a message to the Mexican people that uh, he is working towards a uh, a relationship of mutual respect between the United States and Mexico, and that uh, Trump was essentially a friend of Mexico, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Um, and the Mexican pol- people have largely bought that message. We've seen a reversal in the uh, uh, in in public opinion, whereas you know the United States during the period from 2017 through to December of 2018 was seen in largely negative terms by the Mexican populace. Um, since the beginning of the uh, the AMLO administration, the approval ratings for the United States have gone up. And, and that's an extraordinary thing. But it's because of the way in which that relationship has been communicated, messaged, and more importantly, massaged by uh, by, by AMLO in his daily press uh, briefings, the, the famous Mañaneras that he holds at 7 a.m. every morning in Mexico City. He sends out a message that things are going well in the relationship, that Trump has treated Mexico well and with re- with respect. And of course, that was the central message of that meeting at the White House in July of this year. Um, a very controversial meeting and a very controversial message, less so in Mexico, more so here in the United States. Every time I read about those morning press conferences that AMLO holds, I, I think my lucky stars that I'm not a reporter in Mexico City having to cover them every morning, waking up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning or whatever it is. Well, you've got to think about it, Elliot. I mean, remember, it's not just the uh, the reporters that have to be there. Very often there is a cabinet secretary who's there with him on stage. And remember that that is not the president's first meeting of the day. His first meeting of the day takes place at 6 a.m. in the presidential palace where he holds a meeting of his security cabinet. And I've spoken to, to the, some of the folks who go to those meetings and in the early days. I mean, it was it was hellish for them because they would have to get get to the presidential palace at 5.45 a.m. Um, if they wanted to be on time for the meeting. And then they would go, so often some of them would go on to the uh, the morning press briefing, and then they would begin their work day at around 9 a.m. or 9.30, you know, often going until 10 or 11 at night. Incredible strain on uh, on people within the administration. But what's incredible is that AMLO seems to love it. He th- seems to thrive on it. Um, the man seems to have, uh, you know, boundless energy. Getting back to the point you made earlier about the shift that took place when AMLO took office in U.S.-Mexico relations, I wonder how much of that has to do with AMLO's enduring popularity and the trust that Mexican voters seem to have placed in him to handle the relationship, uh, no matter what happens. I think that's it. I think that uh, yeah, that, that there's, uh, there's an extraordinary phenomenon uh, around AMLO which is that when you look at his public approval numbers, you know, the latest ones put him in the high 60s, um, which historically is not that remarkable. But in the, you know, the 21st century, and particularly following on from a very unpopular uh, president in Enrique Peña Nieto, who, you know, at one point saw his approval rating in single digits. Um, you know, it's it, it's remarkable when you see how popular he is. And it's even more remarkable when you actually delve into the figures in all of the opinion polls that ask the Mexican people about how they see AMLO's performance on specific issues, be it the economy, public security, public health, the fight against corruption, etc. On almost all of those issues, he has a failing grade. But In overall, Mexicans like him and they like him because they believe that he's one of them. They like him because he speaks their language. They like him because he talks about things that matter to them in a way that they understand. And in so many ways, AMLO has bridged the gap between the Mexican government and the Mexican people that was there for decades and a gap that was getting wider and wider um, as, you know, your average Mexican uh, was looking at government and government was becoming sort of bigger and stronger and richer and their lives were staying the same. And AMLO, simply through the force of his personality, his communication style, has managed to convince them that he speaks for them and that he really is one of them. So when he says that he's friends with Trump, 
they identify with that. And what's really fascinating to me, Elliot, was uh, that during the uh, the election uh, campaign here, um, you know, prior to the 3rd of November, um, we heard so many voices in Mexico saying the best thing for Mexico would be a second Trump administration. In the aftermath of the election, we've heard a lot of Mexican voices claiming that those who say that Trump uh, lost the election because of fraud, we've heard voices from Mexico saying that they believe that message. And of course, that's a that's a particularly poignant message for the supporters of Andrés Manuel López Obrador, many of whom believe that he was cheated out of election victory back in 2006. It's very interesting because from the perspective of a casual observer in the United States, it's so hard to see why that would be given uh, all the terrible, harsh and racist rhetoric that Trump has, has leveled toward Mexico and and the kind of you know abusive stance that that even you mentioned that he took toward the, the relationship, seeking to strong arm Mexico and take advantage of the leverage that the United States has over its uh, southern neighbor. It's so interesting, given that, that people would still think that a second Trump term would be beneficial for Mexico. Well, it all comes down to you know the, the point that we made earlier on, which is that they believe AMLO and AMLO's telling them that. So the question becomes, why does AMLO believe that this is that Trump is better for Mexico? And I think it comes down to a very, very simple calculation on his part. You know, AMLO is uh, a nationalist. He's certainly an economic nationalist, but he's a nationalist in the political sense as well. He talks frequently and at length about the concept of sovereignty. We're seeing it right now. I mean, there is a, a growing dispute in the bilateral relationship over the question of diplomatic immunity for DEA agents in Mexico. There, we've just had a, uh, uh, you know, a, a controversial return of a, of a Mexican uh, army general uh, who had been charged on, uh, uh, on, uh, here in the United States. Um, for in a case involving organized crime, he was returned to Mexico. And the the question it always comes back to for AMLO is sovereignty. We need the the Americans need to respect Mexican sovereignty. We then begin to see why he likes Trump, because as I said earlier on, if he if if AMLO uh, satisfies Trump on the question of migration. If AMLO was able to reduce the flow of Central Americans transmigrating through Mexico to the southwest border of the United States, then Trump would largely leave him alone. Trump isn't interested in internal politics in Mexico. Trump isn't interested in the plight of American companies um, who are facing problems with their investments in Mexico, be they in the energy sector or in the pharmaceutical sector, because Trump essentially is a politician who has said over and over again that he wants those same companies to invest in the United States. He's not interested in helping Mexico to retain those investments. And, Tr and AMLO has recognized this. And because of that, he says, all right, so what we'll do is it's a very simple calculation. We give Trump everything that he wants on migration and he doesn't bother us on, on almost anything else. Yes, there's occasional pressure on the question of drug flows. Um, there's pressure every now and again in terms of, uh, of, of trade. But, but really, that's a, that, that's a simple calculation for AMLO to make. He has found this an easy relationship to navigate. And of course, that leads us to the, the question of, well, how is that going to change under a Biden administration? I do want to get to that, but I think it's it's so interesting the dynamic that you've just described because it seems to mirror in many ways the dynamic that Trump has with Central American leaders too, uh, leaders from Guatemala, from El Salvador, um, from Honduras, who basically say, "All right, here's the bargain: we'll give you what you want, Mr. Trump, on migration and exchange. You know, don't bother us on issues with, you know, impingements on the rule of law, on corruption, on." on political freedoms in our countries. It definitely seems, as you said, a very simple calculus that leaders in the region can, can get behind. I think so. Um, you know, I, I don't think at, at, a, at a basic level that there is, uh, you know, that there is a shared worldview between Trump and AMLO, um, except for the fact that they're both nationalists. Um, but uh, there is certainly this understanding on the part of AMLO that 
you know, Trump has a lot of uh, international fish to fry. Um, and so let's not create problems for him. Let's do what he asks. And then essentially his attention will be directed elsewhere. And yes, you're right. I mean, Central American governments have done similar things. Um, and of course, there have been other governments in uh, in the Americas that have decided that they do share a worldview with uh, with Trump. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil being the best example of that. Um, and that's a that's a, that's an interesting calculation on the part of the Central Americans and Mexicans. It's a uh, it's it's fascinating that you have two um, uh, politicians in Trump and Bolsonaro who share that worldview. Um, but that's good as long as Trump was president. And so now we have to think about what happens next. So let's talk about that. Uh, Joe Biden will be coming into office with a very rich background in foreign policy, having dealt directly with a number of uh, hot button issues when he served as vice president under President Barack Obama. And before that, as a longtime member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, much more of a conventional thinker, much more of an establishment sort of foreign policy thinker. What do we know from that history about the kind of approach Biden will take toward Mexico and, and also what kind of chemistry he might have with uh, with AMLO? It's interesting because, uh, you know, Biden is often recognized as being a very uh, sort of personal and personalized politician. I mean, he believes in personal relationships. Um, you know, he, he relates to people on a one on one basis. And that is, uh, you know, that is part of his his uh, you know his personality as a, as a politician but the fact is is that when you look at what he's done on foreign affairs he's really an institutionalist he is a politician uh, who has built institutions who uh, believes in the established channels of diplomacy and intergovernmental relations and in the specific case of Mexico we shouldn't forget that Biden played a critical role in the development of the high-level economic dialogue uh, between Mexico and the United States. And yeah, Biden visited Mexico on a couple of occasions. This was during the Obama administration. This was during the Obama administration, and it was during the Peña Nieto administration in Mexico. And Biden was a strong proponent of building these kinds of institutional mechanisms to bring economic decision making in the two countries closer together. And I, I do believe that Biden, uh, a Biden administration will see a return to those established institutional channels of diplomacy and of collaboration. The question is, wh how will AMLO respond to that? Because AMLO himself is not an institution builder. AMLO is not a politician who believes in using institutional approaches. He is much more in the Trump mold of using personal statements, uh, of, of using personal relationships as a way to, to build diplomacy, as we saw in the case of, uh, uh, of his relationship with, with Donald Trump. So I think that this is going to be a, uh, a tough uh, ask for the uh, for the Biden administration to build an institutional approach in the bilateral relationship with a government that doesn't really believe in institutions. So in a sense, it will be more of a relationship based on whatever personal chemistry Biden might be able to build with AMLO is what you're saying? Well, I think that that, that could be one way to break through. But I actually see a, a, something different. I think that we may need uh, to see a more aggressive approach, certainly a firmer approach from Biden than we might expect. In other words, I think the Biden administration needs to send a message early on to AMLO that although uh, President-elect Joe Biden is not the same as Donald Trump, that he's nonetheless willing to use the, uh, the, the power of the United States to get outcomes that he desires. And he'll do that in a different way than Donald Trump. It won't be through public statements, threats of closing the border, etc. But there needs to be a very firm statement from the administration early on here that Mexico needs to play ball, not just on migration, but on trade, on uh, the treatment of American investors within the country, uh, on drugs and organized crime, on the fight against corruption. And this is where it takes us to um, sort of the, the second element of what I see from a Biden administration, which is that 
whereas Trump was largely unidimensional in focusing on migration, a Biden administration is going to have migration, security, trade, investment, climate, anti-corruption. In other words, this is going to be a multidimensional relationship. And that's going to be a lot more complicated and complex uh, for for AMLO to deal with. And it's not the kind of relationship that he's going to be relishing. He's also taking office at a rather difficult time in the relationship because of the incident you mentioned earlier, the arrest in October of a former Mexican defense minister, high-ranking general who was charged with drug trafficking. Those charges were subsequently dropped after an uproar in Mexico and reportedly some direct pressure from AMLO himself. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that incident and the damage it did and is continuing to do uh, to cooperation on drug enforcement and security issues more broadly between uh, the U.S. and Mexico. So let's begin with uh, the arrest itself. Uh, Let's not forget that uh, here in the United States, the arrest of such a high-profile figure as General Cienfuegos would not have taken place unless the, uh, the attorneys involved, the prosecutors, were pretty sure that they could get a conviction. In other words... You know, we we should be um, we should be pretty certain that there is compelling evidence there um, on the part of from the United States. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they needed to have an airtight case. Exactly, um, and that raised a question, uh, which was, well, haven't we been co- cooperating with this uh, individual for years during the Peña Nieto administration, presumably sharing sensitive intelligence with him? And if that's the case, why were we not doing proper background checks and vet- vetting on him? And you know, having spoken to folks who were yeah, d- closely involved at a high level in the bilateral relationship at the time, they said because the Penieto administration didn't let us have those that that kind of access, they didn't allow us to vet their cabinet secretaries. And so you know, and and that raises the question of trust. You know, how can we actually trust the you know, high-ranking officials on the Mexican side that, you know, if we're not allowed to vet them properly. And so I think that the arrest itself was a bit of a, uh, 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 I guess the arrest itself was a a bit of a, a bombshell in the relationship in the sense that, well, we've been working with people and now we're finding out that they were probably not clean. That's 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 a problem for the relationship. It it really does shake the foundations of trust. Then you get to the second phase, which is that the Mexicans are uh, are complaining that the basic principles of sovereignty have been violated because a former Mexican cabinet secretary has been arrested uh, in the United States. I don't think that is a violation of sovereignty. The Mexicans said the Americans should have told us about it first. We were unaware. And there was some dispute as to whether the uh, Mexican ambassador here in Washington knew about it, about whether she had communicated that to AMLO. AMLO later on said, yes, she did say something, but I didn't think it was a real um, complaint or something. Um, And, you know, we have so there there once again, we hear the... uh, uh, we, we we hear sovereignty being used uh, from the from the AMLO uh, administration's point of view, and the third phase of this is when uh, Attorney General Barr makes the decision to dismiss the cases against uh, to dismiss the case against Cienfuegos, return him to Mexico. The Mexicans say, "Oh yes, don't worry, we're going to follow all the right procedures here," but Cienfuegos gets home. And basically is sent straight to his house um, and he's a free man. And there's enormous skepticism and justifiably so that he will ever come to trial in Mexico. And the reason for that is because the military is too important to AMLO. And by getting Cienfuegos off, by getting him out of the United States, he has created now a uh, a relationship with the Mexican army where they owe him a favor and they recognize that he has defended their interests because to have one of their top brass in an American prison would not go down well. So this has been an amazingly um, intricate uh, uh, a period of time for the bilateral relationship just on this one case we see so many of the elements, the, the institutional weaknesses of Mexico, the 
uh, the controversial relationship between AMLO and the military, um, the use of nationalism and sovereignty. I think we're seeing so much of what AMLO is all about coming out in this case. And in terms of this precipitous decline in trust in the relationship and in security cooperation that you just mentioned, what's the timing in the context in terms of the campaign in Mexico against violent organized uh, criminal organizations and, and drug gangs? What kind of crisis is Mexico facing and how will this uh, you know, breach of trust affect that? Well, homicides are at record highs. Um, you know, every year when we do our evaluation of Mexico, which we, we usually do in January at our annual Security and Rule of Law Forum, we generally say, you know, uh, homicide numbers are at record levels. Um, uh, the good news is it can't go up much more, but every year it seems to go up a little bit more. And that's what we've seen throughout the uh, the AMLO administration so far. The first two years, you know, AMLO had said that he was going to slash the number of homicides that took place in Mexico. That has not happened. Um, in terms of the hold of by organized crime over the country, we have seen uh, continued disruption of the work of the major cartels, Sinaloa cartel, Gulf cartel, etc. But we have seen the rise of uh, of new cartels. The, uh, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, which is uh, creating havoc throughout large parts of Western Mexico and in uh, some parts of, uh, of Southern and Eastern Mexico as well. Um, and we've seen the fragmentation of the larger uh, uh, drug organizations as well, which means that really, sadly, tragically, there is no end in sight for the violence. There's no end in sight for uh, the flow of drugs northwards. But one other thing, um, there is a, uh, a mutation taking place in, uh, in the drug business uh, in recent years, which is the shift from uh, yeah, traditional drugs like cocaine, marijuana, heroin uh, to synthetic drugs, uh, drugs that are created um, using precursor chemicals, many of which come in from Asia. And the markups on these uh, on these drugs is, are huge, and they're incredibly potent and very very dangerous. Um, AMLO clearly does not have a handle on the public security or the organized crime problem in Mexico. Uh, his outgoing uh, Secretary of Public Security, Durazo, uh, in the two years that he was in the job, failed to uh, uh, lay out a public security strategy for the country which meant that there was there were no overarching principles for dealing with public security and uh, and the handling of organized crime and we have to uh, wait and see what his successor will come up with um i always go back to the fact that bilateral collaboration uh is critically important in this even though the merida initiative uh, a bilateral agreement between mexico and the united states that was uh, signed in 2007 and uh, laid out the guiding principles for uh, uh, cooperation on organized crime and, uh, and, uh, and anti-narcotics. Um, even though the Merida Initiative has clearly uh, failed to stop the rise of violence, it has failed to stop the flow of drugs northwards, it has, in its 13-year existence, been able to build uh, ties between the agencies, the security agencies in both Mexico and the United States, uh, has helped to strengthen mutual trust and respect. And unfortunately, we're seeing all of that um, being torn apart right now. And AMLO himself has uh, recently sent the message that he he really doesn't want to see the Merida Initiative continuing. We saw a, a statement from a uh, a representative of the foreign affairs ministry in Mexico saying out that saying that the Merida initiative itself is over. Um, we have not heard that statement from the U S government. And I think one of the major tasks for, uh, the, uh, for both the Biden administration and for the U S Congress in 2021 is to look at the security relationship with Mexico and to push for a renewed institutional approach in that simply because the Mexicans seem to be uh, a little bit lost at this point in time. There doesn't seem to be a very uh, well thought out approach on their part. And for that reason, the United States should be there to assist them. But as always, the problem with AMLO is that he probably doesn't want to 
cooperate with the United States. He wants to minimize that interaction as much as possible. On the issue of migration, Biden has pledged to take a much more humane approach to the southern border in a dramatic shift from Trump's efforts to stop immigrants from entering the United States at all costs, both legally and illegally. At the same time, Biden probably remembers well from his time in the Obama administration that a, a sudden influx of migrants at the border can cause a massive political crisis. So, so what does this mean for Mexico in terms of how it approaches the issue of mostly Central American migrants who transit through its territory to the United States? I think that's the biggest bargaining chip that AMLO has in his uh, relationship with uh, with Biden is to say, you know, look, you I know that to have a surge on the on the US southwest border would be disastrous politically uh, for the Biden administration. So how badly do you want us to keep collaborating with you on this? And in other words, to try to get the same kind of deal that he got with Trump. And I think that's going to be complicated. It's complicated for AMLO because the Biden administration, the Biden team wants to talk about lots of different issues. But it's complicated for Biden because, as I've heard many times over the past eight years in my job as, uh, as, as director of the Mexico Institute, you know, you speak to folks in U.S. law enforcement, uh, folks in State Department, uh, Department of Justice, etc., and they say, yeah, we, we can propose things to Mexico, but really our cooperation with them only goes as far as the Mexicans want it to go. In other words, we need them to say yes in order for cooperation to be successful. And uh, if AMLO is determined that bilateral security cooperation is over, it's going to be very difficult for the United States to force them to do that. And that's why I said earlier on, I think it's vitally important that a strong, firm message is sent early on by the Biden administration to show how serious it is about cooperating with Mexico, to show how serious it is in terms of the importance of the relationship and the implications of that relationship for internal po politics here in the United States. But it's also an opportunity to say we're willing, you know, we want to be firm, we want to be strong, but we're also willing to pay a large part of the costs of that public security and anti-narcotics cooperation. We want to help Mexico as much as possible. And a combination of the carrot and stick approach, I think, may well uh, be, be, be productive uh, with AMLO even though he clearly doesn't want to go down that path. He may feel as though he's forced to if he, if he fears that Biden will get somehow more aggressive and uh, will uh, challenge AMLO uh, openly in the US and Mexican media. An opportunity for Biden to take a page out of uh, Trump's playbook, perhaps. I think so. I mean, you know, whether you you love Trump or hate him, one of the things that he showed in the bilateral relationship is that if you are forceful with Mexico and if your threats are credible, then you can get them to do what you want. Duncan, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Elliot. Duncan Wood is the director of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., if you'd like to comment on the discussion, ask a question, or even suggest a topic for a future episode, drop us a line at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. This episode of Trend Lines was produced by me, Elliot Waldman, and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow the team on Twitter if you'd like. WPR's handle is at WP Review. I'm at Elliot Waldman. That's with two L's and one T. And Peter is at P-E-T-E-R-D-O-E-R-R-I-E. -E -E. Thanks for listening and tune in again next week. Mm -hmm.